Jewish Education and Media is pleased to present L'Chaim, a program that highlights the people, issues, and events of importance to the Jewish community. Now here is your host, Rabbi Mark Golub. I'm Mark Golub. And the BDS movement, the attempt to delegitimize the state of Israel, to impose economic, cultural boycotts, divestments, and sanctions on Israel, takes many forms, some of which are very subtle and seductive. No Jew wants the Israeli army, the IDF, Israel Defense Forces, to engage in immoral or cruel behavior. As violent as Palestinian terrorists may be, stabbing children while they sleep in their beds, hacking praying rabbis to pieces in a synagogue, driving cars and trucks into groups of Jews waiting at a bus stop, blowing themselves up to murder Jews in cafes, shooting people as they eat in a restaurant. As violent and heinous as Palestinian terrorists may be, the Jewish people and the Israeli people want the idea, IDF to do everything humanly possible to protect civilian Palestinian lives and never to engage in brutality of any kind, physical or emotional. That's what Israelis want. It's what the Jewish people want. And it's what the IDF is committed to. And yet there are those in our world who would demonize the state of Israel and the IDF. And this, too, is an ugly expression of the BDS movement. And sadly, it has given rise to an organization that purports to expose the truth about the IDF. The organization is called Breaking the Silence. It's received a lot of attention abroad and here, especially on college campuses. Breaking the Silence is an NGO which publishes anonymous testimonies by IDF soldiers who claim the IDF is guilty of crimes against Palestinians. And there are Hillel organizations on college campuses which invite Breaking the Silence to address their students. Now, if there is any systematic brutality being done by IDF forces, it should be known and the proper disciplinary action should be taken to punish those officers and soldiers who are guilty. But are the charges true? Are the charges true? Remember, those making the charges are anonymous, which makes it virtually impossible to cross-examine the testimony they give. Well, one Israeli officer became aware of breaking the silence while serving as company commander in Hebron. And in response to breaking the silence, he founded a counter-organization named Reservists on Duty, which sees as its mission answering the charges of breaking the silence and telling the true story of IDF behavior, setting the record straight so that people will understand the extraordinary ethic and practices of the Israel Defense Forces. I'm honored to introduce you to Major Amit Derry, founder and chairman of Reservists on Duty. I mean, it is wonderful having you on this table. Thank, Thank you, you for much. joining us. Thank you. And Yashikar, uh, Kolakavo for all the work you do. Thank you. Uh, first, tell me a little bit about you. Where were you born? I'm uh, 34 years old. I was born in the Golan Heights, born and raised there. Okay. Who are your parents? Where are they from? They uh, they born in uh, in Israel, in Tiberias. You are second generation? Yeah. I'm Sabra? Second. Yeah, yeah. Okay, very nice. I'm a Sabra. Do you have any brothers or sisters? Yeah, I have two brothers. 
I'm the oldest. I have two brothers and one sister. Very good. Yeah. Are you married? Yeah. Two, two children. Lovely. Two Mazal tov. <laughs> How old are your children? One is a year and a half, and the other is uh, three months old. Mazal tov. It's a Thank lot you. of work. Thank you. Yeah. What's your, what's your wife's name? Danielle. Danielle. Well, you and Danielle have <laughs> worked there, but Mazal tov is very nice. You, you were born, you say, in the Golan? Yeah. Where do you live now? Now we are uh, in Puria, next to Tiberias. Okay. And uh, what's the religious background of your family, and what kind of Judaism was in your home? Oh, it's an interesting question. Today I'm a secular, yes. but I was born and raised in an in a Orthodox uh, in a, a family, and uh, I've been to a yeshiva. No kidding. I was, uh, Sephardic? Yeah. Sephardic yeshiva, and uh, today I'm secular, but I think uh, Judaism is part of who I am, it's part of me, it's part of what I'm doing, uh, without the kippah and the... Uh, I understand. But I understand. it's part of me. Yes. Everything I do is part of it, yeah. Interesting. Um, I have to ask, so you're in the yeshiva world, and something, something happened to you, and now you consider yourself a secularist. First of all, does that create any tension between you and your parents? At the beginning, yeah. yeah sure. You're, uh, you know, you go in other way. Yes. But uh, I, I don't know if to call myself a secular. I don't think it's a good word. I'm not a secular, but I'm not a practical orthodox. Okay, say. you're not dati and you're not observing yeah. in that way. Yeah, but I think uh, Judaism it's I critical said, is, to part, you. is part of, of, what I, of who I am. Of course. Your wife, too? Uh, my wife is religious. Orthodox, yeah. It's an interesting house. <laughs> though. I'm keeping Shabbat, and uh, it's an interesting house. It's an interesting house. It's a lovely way of saying it. Mm -hmm. But you're having a good time. Yeah, sure. Is Shabbat lovely in your house, Friday night? Yeah, yeah. It's Describe like, it to us. If, 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 you were, if I were lucky enough to be invited to your home on a Friday night, what would I see? It's like, it's like a Hasidic Shabbat. <laughs> you will hear some uh, niguns, and you will hear some... Uh, Songs and uh, it's. I, th I think Shabbat is the most beautiful idea in Judaism. I agree. So even if you are uh, religious or secular, I think Shabbat is one of the yes. of the presence of. Uh, you know, it's interesting. Sometimes the nomenclature in Israel and the nomenclature in America, for American Jews, is very different. What American Jews mean by religious, or what they mean by secular, is not the same as it means to the Israeli. And very often, a secular or a non-observant Israeli will live very much the life of mm -hmm. a middle-of-the-road American Jew who may not be orthodox, may not be terribly observant, but they're trying to create a Jewish family for themselves and have a Jewish home. And in America, we work at it. For the Israeli... The, the home you and your wife have created, it's a touch more, a little bit more spontaneous. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. It's it, when you live in Israel, when your whole, uh, you know, your, your whole environment are Jewish people, and you're going to school, it's all Jewish people, and you're going to the university, and so even if you're a secular, you live in a way of uh, way of life, like like a Jewish man and the Jewish family. And here in the States, if you are a secular, it's harder because you're not going to shul and you're not going to, uh, your, your environment is, uh, is not Jewish. So I think it's hard to keep, um, to keep yourself with, uh, let's say, a Jewish spirit. Yes. It's harder. It's harder. Yeah. Absolutely doable, but it's harder. It's harder. Yes. Your English is superb. Where did you learn English? Ah. Oh. Uh, it's, not. it's superb. Where did you learn English? Uh, it's funny, but Bob Dylan. <laughs> <laughs> he's a fabulous he is the man. Music. <laughs> I'm playing guitar and harmonica and Bob Dylan and, uh, ah. and Leonard Cohen. I think that's the only way I learn English. Very nice. You play the guitar? Yeah. What kind of music? Folk or what? Folk. That's my, that's my love. Had I known there would have been a guitar here for you to play. Oh. Next time. Next time. Next time. Next time. So you're, you go to high school, and then you go into the IDF? Yeah. Okay. And which unit do you serve in when you first go into the IDF? Uh, I've been to lots of units because I've been to the Army for 10 years. So I've been, I started in a, in a unit called Chawuv, Infantry Unit, Special Unit. And, uh, you know, 
along the way and I changed units and uh, do some um, uh, jobs and uh, I finished the army when I was a company commander after Operation uh, uh, Cast Lead uh, for 10 years in the army. Um, that's longer than typical. Yeah. Why 10 years? That's an interesting question. Uh, I didn't, I didn't thought at the beginning, I didn't thought that I will be uh, uh, so much time in the army. But you know, when you are doing it, and your soldiers, and uh, and the, and uh, uh, and the things you are doing to uh, protect Israel, is keeping you uh, like to do it more and more. So I stayed. I don't know. I stayed a year more and a year more, and it's you know ten years. By the way, if you were in Operation Cast Lead. You saw action, I'm afraid, yes? Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, I have people sit here all the time. They're passionate about Israel. They have enormous regard for the IDF. They were in there. But they always say war is really hell and that most Americans don't have a clue what fighting is about. Do you agree? For sure, I agree. War, nobody want to be in a war. Nobody want to, uh, you know, be in a battlefield. It's, uh, it's horrible. But I think for Israel, it's the only way to survive. For us, it's the only way to survive. And when we start war, we never start war. When we are responding to uh, rockets falling on our houses from Gaza, or we are responding to terrorist attacks in Judea and Samaria, we have to do that. We have to do that. And uh, in Operation Cast Lead, after almost two weeks of uh, rockets coming from Gaza to, uh, to e all over Israel, we must, uh, we, we must go in. So that's what we do. And uh, we talked about ethics and about the IDF. In the Operation Kastled, I, uh, I was a company commander. Uh, just to have a good friend of mine together with me, he was a company commander also. And uh, uh, in the middle of the operation, uh, he go um, between the houses, you know, we had a, a chopper about us. We can decide as commanders either to bomb or not a place that we suspected that uh, a, a terrorist of Hamas could be. And uh, to make a l very long story short, uh, Roy, who was my friend, he decided not to bomb a specific house. Because? Because, because he saw some civilians around and he, and he thought it might be a, a civilian casualties around. And uh, the minute he crossed that street, he got a missile, an RPG missile, that hit him directly, him and his uh, radio men. And, uh, and he died in Operation Castle. He was a major, uh, uh, great man. And you know, the minute I got out from that operation, I think it was a month af after that, I saw in the, in the, on the television uh, that group breaking the silence on the UN saying that the IDF throw his ethical code out of the window. And I think for me it was the starting point to think, whoa, what is that? Where does that come from? And two years after that, when I left the army, three years after that, when I left the army, I started uh, this organization. Uh, called reservist on duty because we are really believe that breaking the sil silence is one of the of the uh, worst or bad organizations Israeli organizations for Israel today in Israel and abroad here in the states uh, so I think that for me was the starting point mm -hmm. what were some of the things you heard breaking the silence saying about IDF soldiers and I've read a great deal about it, and there was a specific in individual who was saying very bad things about how the Israeli army operated and what soldiers did and how they basically were I, I, indiscri indiscriminate violence against Palestinian civilians. I use the word lies and not bad things. Lies, mm -hmm. blood labels, mm -hmm. who used by all of the uh, BDS movements today. And I'll give you... Some uh, 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 example. Uh, it was a year and a half that we, me, and, and a couple of our friend, of my friends, we uh, uh, follow follow them. A year and a half, undercover. We what wanted do you mean to undercover? know. What's undercover? Undercover. Mean? It means I can't tell you everything. How I, how we do that? 
But we did that. We wanted to get into those specific... You infiltrated. Yeah. Yeah, that's the word. Okay. <laughs> we thought, uh, uh, we wanted to know what they tell in in those VIP tours to European Parliament members, where the money comes from, uh, VIP tours in Hebron. Hebron is a very complicated city where Jews and Palestinians live together. Not really together, side by side. Side by side, right. yeah, but mixed in the same place. Where, but not, no. In Hebron, it's house, house uh, uh, you can see a house of Jewish family and a house of a Palestinian family. I'm sorry. When I went to Hebron, there were two distinct pieces. One was this large Arab mm -hmm. city, which no Jew was allowed into. You're right. And then there is the Jewish quarter, the Jewish section you're of right. Hebron. And if you walk down the street, at that point you're work, walking. There are also Arabs who are walking, especially as you head towards the cave of Machpelah. You're right. Okay. You're right. 97% 97, 97 of, of Hebron is Ar Arabic. Correct. 3% is the Jewish community, right. but inside the Jewish community, do you have some houses of Palestinians, and okay. Palestinians are allowed to, to walk in those streets. Okay. So it's a very complicated place. And we managed to get to those VIP tours, and we got some videos. That was the starting point, point for us. What did you hear? So uh, uh, in one video, we saw Avner Gvaryao, which, by the way, he's the representative of Breaking the Silence here in the States. He's a student in Columbia University, saying to uh, two parliament members that we, the IDF soldiers, uh, uh, when we are boring, it's boring, what, we're, what we do is uh, we are looking for a Palestinian houses with satellites. And then we're breaking into the house, cover the eyes of all the people in the house, lock them in a room, and sitting and watching uh, a soccer game on TV. For us, it was a shock. Oh, no, wait, exactly. understand, I'm only asking because I have to. Yeah. Is there any truth to that? Sure not. It's an outrageous lie, is it's, it not? It's a lie. It's a lie. And we are, uh, you know, 95 of, the, of their testimonies are anonymous. So you can never prove it. And 5% uh, uh, is with... Uh, you know, videos of people talking about themselves, most of them are part of the Breaking the Silence group. And one of them is, is Avner Gvayao. So the next step we did, we took those videos, the f the, those 5% who are not anonymous, like Avner Gvayao himself, talking about war crimes that he participated with his team members in the army. And we said, wait a minute, if he's a liar, he probably lied also here. So we, we took uh, uh, five videos of him talking about himself and his team members. So me and my friends, we gathered all his team members. They are all in their thirties now, and uh, you know, doctors and, and lawyers and uh, they're students, and uh, 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 they have families already. It was three months. We gathered fifteen, one five people in 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 same room, and we showed them those videos, and we told them, "Oh, you are war criminals. You should be on on prison." And you know, there was one man, uh, he lost his legs in, in one of the operations in Nablus. He started to cry. I didn't know he, was, he lost his leg. He was with, with long pants. And he walked out of the room. So what happened? I said, he was his friend. And the minute they saw those, they never saw that. You know, those videos are, uh, are the main fuel of the BDS movement, of SJP, of people all over the world who want to attack Israel, who want to attack the, the ethics of the IDF. I said, I said to them, all right, we're going to take a video of all of you saying that here is lying. Did all of them say it was a all lie? All of them. We have that video. You see, that, that was for the media in Israel. The minute we released those videos, those uh, VIP tours from Hebron and his team members from the army, it was... Uh, it was a very big debate about the organization. That was uh, seven months ago. Uh, we invited by Prime Minister Netanyahu, uh, who wanted to see those materials from first hand, and uh, President Rivlin and uh, uh, Bogi Alon. You know, they, they, they used to be in the army in some places. They used to give some lectures in the army. 
and Boogie Yalon said, enough is enough. The minute he saw how our materials, he said, enough. They will not get into the army anymore. The same with Naftali Bennett, the Ministry of Education. He said they will not be in any formal uh, uh, institute of, uh, of the State of Israel talking about the idea. Had they been before? Yeah. Why? Because nobody managed to prove that they are lying. They are lying. And they're lying a lot. Well, just one example from three weeks ago. Mahmoud Abbas said uh, on, uh, on, the, on the EU parliament, he said, Israel is poisoning Palestinian water. So where it comes from? It comes from somewhere. And if you go back to the videos, you will see Yuda Shaul, the ma the, one of the, of the heads of Breaking the Silence, saying the same that Jewish people poisoning Palestinian water all over Judea and Samaria, which is funny because it's the same water for the Palestinians and for the Jewish people there. So it all comes from uh, uh, specific uh, places like breaking the silence. Mm -hmm. Have you ever talked with, have you ever confronted someone who is from breaking the silence? Yeah, numerous and, times. And have you ever had a chance privately, not in front of a group, to say to this individual, why do you say this? What do you think motivates the Mamit? It's a good question. I think I'm, I'm already, I think, three or four years following them. It's a very hard question, and I think, I think there is a couple of answers. It's not a one answer. But uh, for your question, yes, I, I've talked with them a lot. I was debating them all over in, in, in the media in Israel, in the, in the in newspapers and all. And uh, I think the answer is three things. One, it's money. It's money. You're getting paid. By whom? All right. That's also a good question. By whom? I'll give you just one example. There is an organization called ICCO. It's an Dutch, a Christian Dutch organization. What are the letters? ICCO. They have a contract. In uh, 20, uh, I think 2014, it was in 2014, contract job. You will give us 90 negative testimonies on the idea of soldiers, and you will get, I think, I don't remember the exact amount, I think it's 40,000 euros. I want to make sure to say, yeah, yeah, yeah. there's, no there's a contract that says, here's the deal. Yeah. Uh, you give me testimonies, I give you negative. money. Negative. Yes, negative yeah. testimonies, and I give you money. Yeah. Uh, there's a written contract. Have you ever seen the contract? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's outrageous. Yeah. So, you know, when money is, uh, is, is an issue, you cannot talk about moral. You cannot be a, a, an organization who, was, who is talking about moral. So money is one thing. And, and most of the money comes from foreign governments and foreign organizations abroad. Foreign who've got governments? Foreign interests interest in, in Israel. For example? For the Dutch organization. Yes. Uh, there is one, uh, Trikura. It's an, uh, it's an Irish organization. Uh, the money comes from Norway, from Switzerland, from Sweden. Why? Again, the, the, the organization breaking the silence for is fighting the occupation. That's the goal. They don't want to see us in Judea and Samaria, which is a, 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 a legitimized goal. You know, there is it's people a legitimate in goal for people to say we shouldn't be Israel should yeah, not be sure, in Judea Samaria. Sure, sure. It's not legitimate. a problem to say that. Of course, yeah, it's not a problem. But when you use the idea of soldiers cynically, and when you use uh, uh, um, to promote your agenda, you use people, and you are lying, and you are uh, uh, getting paid by foreign governments, and you're getting money from foreign governments. You know, there is a a, a fund based in Ramallah. And that fund, getting money from, uh, um, from European governments. And that fund, that based in Ramallah, giving money to who? To break in the silence. And by the way, the same fund, giving money to an organization named Al-Haq. al, -Haq. al in, in Arabic, it's the law. al -Haq, the Palestinian organization, is in charge of uh, 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 bringing the IDF soldiers into the uh, court of Hague on war crimes. So you see the triangle? 
You've got an uh, Elchak, and you've got the foundation who gives money to Elchak, and also giving money to breaking the silence. And you can just imagine that, that uh, 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 you know, triangle. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think the answer is money, in a way. I think the, the second answer is twisted ideology. <laughs> we can see that all over the world today. The extreme left-wing uh, uh, um, ideology is twisted. It's blind. And, uh, and I think most of the people there are with twisted ideology. Mm -hmm. It's important for me to ask you. Yeah. Are there any, ever, any instances when an Israeli soldier goes too far or in some way does something that you feel breaks the code of the IDF? Sure. The answer is sure. Sure. In any army, any army in the world, we are not moral than any other country. We are regular people. We are regular army, like everyone. We want to live a regular life. But in any army of the Western uh, world, doing mistakes, you know, <laughs> it's weapons. It's uh, uh, um, people who are, uh, uh, you know, uh, in, in the civilian are areas, Sometimes doing mistakes, but the commanders are there, and the, and, and and it's a maybe a one in a million incident that the commanders always taking care of and, and, and investigating to see what happened. Uh, but I think in any army you've got, you know, in er, in, in every place all over the world. But uh, I think it's a one in a million incident. The idea of doing, I'll give you an example from Operation Custard, what we did before we got into Gaza. One, we are uh, pamphlets from the air. I think the minute we got into Gaza, we stepped, I think, on a million of pamphlets, telling the civilians to go uh, uh, out of the battlefield. We signed, the IDF uh, uh, drew the lines where he will get in. And you know, the enemy is used that. So that's one thing. The second thing we did, uh, it's called knock on the roof bombs. Before we are, uh, the IDF is bombing a, a, a civilian area, he's first uh, uh, launching a, a, a knock on the roof bomb. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a missile who's just doing a, a noise to uh, make you understand that the IDF is going to attack. And just five minutes after that, you're going to bomb the area. So that's second. The third thing is all the civilians in Gaza got phone calls in Arabic saying you, got, you have to evacuate from those specific places because the IDF will be there tonight, tomorrow, in a couple of hours. So I think the IDF is doing the best, we are doing the best we can to avoid civilian casualties. But we also need to win. We need to win the bad guys, the people who are uh, bad, by the way, bad guys not just to Israel, to the very Palestinian civilians. They're using Palestinian civilians. Uh, I think in, in Kaslet and Protective Edge, I saw my, in my own eyes how the Hamas members, terrorists, using children and women to protect, as human shields, to protect the missiles area when they're launching to Israel missiles. So I think the IDF doing the best we are doing the best we can to avoid civilian casualties. Mm -hmm. By the way, I want to draw a distinction. Mm -hmm. One is the painful reality that civilians will be caught in war. That's not what people are worried about. That's really not what Breaking the Silence is saying. Breaking the Silence is saying there are Israeli soldiers who for no reason at all are either physically or emotionally brutalizing Palestinians. The example you gave, which has been published, that Israeli soldiers mm -hmm. went into Palestinian homes, blindfolded Palestinians, put them in a closet so they, the Israelis, could watch television. That's not in the course of war. No. Okay, there are charges all the time of Israeli IDF brutality. There was the famous photograph that was on the front page of the New York Times mm -hmm of an Israeli, of a Palestinian child being shielded by a father 
moments before he was killed, it turned out that the picture was a false picture. But what Breaking the Silence is saying is not that there are, not simply that there are painfully civilian casualties in war. Breaking the Silence is saying there is a, a, a an orchestrated and mm -hmm. a, or a uh, permitted, it's permitted by, by, the commanders. by the commanders for Israeli soldiers to brutalize Palestinians. And it begins, by the way, when you see an American, in the American media, it begins with checkpoints. It's as if the checkpoints were the most heinous thing any country could do to another country. But I want you to speak to that issue. The issue is not civilian casualties during war, whether it's Operation Kestled or mm -hmm. Operation Protective Edge. Mm -hmm. It's are there... Is there any kind of concerted, orchestrated the answer is permit no. Right. The answer is no, period. There is no. And 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 those testimonies and those it's it's lies. It's blood labels. Blood labels. That's what it is. That's what it is. We have to call it like uh, the the way it is. It's blood labels. Blood libels. Blood but libels. it's coming from within Israel. Blood libels, you know, when, the, when there were blood libels in Damascus or Great Britain or in the Arab mm -hmm. world, lo and behold, it was the other who was charging the Jew. Here, I mean, you've got Jews, you've got Israelis expressing the blood libel. I, I, I keep using the word, it is outrageous to me. And it's also outrageous to me in some way. It's difficult for me to believe that in Israel itself, breaking the silence ever got traction. How was that possible? You're right. It's so, it's so frustrating to know that people from within, people from within, like spies, people from within uh, are fueling and, you know, uh, motivating the BDS movement and the haters of Israel all over the world. And you can see that. We are following uh, all of the Facebook pages of SG, Students for Justice, and Palestine, and others, uh, BDS movements here in the States, and you can see them using the very same uh, 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 materials that the Breaking the Silence produce, or B'Tselem produce. So yeah, it's very, very frustrating, and that's, that's why I think, that's why we establish reservists on duty. Try to expose them, try to, uh, uh, to show the world and the people in Israel that they are lying. Mm -hmm. They are always lying. Okay, I'm just disappointed the Israelis had to be convinced. It should have been obvious. Every Israeli has been in the IDF. Mm -hmm. I mean, do you ever reflect on the fact that there is something in the Israeli mentality, that there are Israelis who took this organization seriously? Do you understand well, the, why I'm yeah, incredulous yeah, yeah. here? Yeah. First, 80% of, the, of their activities abroad now are not in Israel. Most of the people in Israel don't believe them. But, you know, they are smart. I can tell a lot of things about them. They're smart. Tell me one thing about them. <laughs> <laughs> they are really smart. They know how they were the first organization who used, you know, to, to talk as an IDF soldier, testimonies of soldiers. It's very sensitive. You know, everyone in Israel is sensitive to, to our soldiers, to our children, to our fighters. And they knew that if they will use those testi anonymous testimonies, it will be hard for Israeli uh, uh, people to, you know, to engage, to, to try to refute. It will be harder because, oh, an Israeli soldier said that. So it's very smart to do it in Israel, and it's very smart to do it abroad because ah, you are an Israeli. You are an Israeli soldier who is saying that we are war criminals, that we are... Uh, uh, treating the Palestinians like, I don't know, like in a ghetto. So I think they are very smart mm -hmm. in, in, uh, in uh, breaking the silence. Mm -hmm. But your real concern is the influence they wield in Europe and on American college campuses, yes? Yes. I think, unfortunately, in Europe, I think we, we, we lost it. We are not trying to, uh, to engage campuses in Europe. But here in the States, there is a struggle. There is a struggle. And I think we need more people to be part of that struggle. And I think we need uh, uh, Israelis to be part of that struggle. Because, uh, uh, you know, 
in the, in most of the most of the organizations, a lot of organizations doing a great job, doing a great work. But most of the organization doing Hasbara, regular Hasbara. We call it Hasbara is to apologize before the debate begin. <laughs> And we think we need another way. We've, we need people who are really familiar with the facts, who are really familiar with the reality in Israel, uh, to be part of that struggle here against breaking the silence and, and others' organizations here in the States and against BDS movements here mm -hmm. in the States. Incidentally, tell our audience how you feel about B'Tselem, which, again, is seen as an organization that's trying to simply bring a sense of justice to the state of Israel. You, you mentioned B'Tselem in the same mm -hmm. breath as you mentioned breaking the silence. How do you feel about B'Tselem? Explain, explain to our audience exactly what they do and how you feel about them. B'Tselem is doing the same, like breaking the silence, but not the same. Who works for B'Tselem? Palestinians. They've got a camera that they got from uh, thousands of workers with cameras in, in Gaza and in Judea and Samaria. And uh, the job is to take photo, uh, uh, to take videos of IDF soldiers and the reality of the occupied territories. That's what Betelem do. And when he, he's got a specific video, he released that uh, to the media. But I think uh, uh, the goal of uh, either Betelem or breaking the silence is not to do Israel better. It's not to help us to solve a, a specific problem. It's only one goal, to denounce Israel internationally. The minute they have a specific video, like B'Tselem, the minute they have a specific video, the goal is to spread that video as fast as they can in every international channel or, or, or you know, uh, media. That's the goal, to denounce Israel as far and, and, and as, as hard as they can. And their ultimate goal is what? Again, the same. The same it's like breaking the It's not to silence. improve Israel. No. It's to what? It's to change. I think it's, it's, it's uh, to change uh, uh, the reality of, uh, of Judea and Samaria and Gaza. Take Israel out of Judea and Samaria. We are already out of Gaza. To take Israel out of Judea and Samaria and give the Palestinians the state. Okay, That's but in and of itself, you're not opposed to that. I'm not opposed to that. I think it's you a, just it's don't a, want to do it by vilifying Israel. Yeah, I think it's a, if you're doing, you've got a lot of organizations like Shalom Achshav, mm, Peace, Peace now. now. You've got a lot of uh, left-wing uh, uh, parties in, uh, sitting in the Knesset with the same agenda, but the method, the thing, the the, the uh, what you use to promote that agenda, that's the problem. And I think breaking the silence and B'Tselem using uh, a, a cynical method. Okay. I want to know whether you think I'm going too far. I often feel that the BDS movement is fueled by people who believe in some way the state of Israel itself is an illegitimate state. That Yes, the Jewish people went through the Holocaust. Yes, the Jewish people, if you look over their history, mm -hmm. have, there's been the wandering Jew who's gone from place to place. For a little while, he's always welcome. The next thing you know, he's thrown out. And yes, they should have a home. But ultimately, they built a home on the backs of people who were here before. They robbed land. I don't know if you have ever had contact with Ari Shavit. Mm -hmm. He wrote the book, My Promised Land. And Ari Shavit's, the premise of my, of my promised land is, the premise is, while we need a state of our own, and while I love the state of Israel, Ari Shavit says, for me and my children, he says, we destroyed a people and we took their land. And... I don't, you know, I know Ari Shavit does not want Israel to go out of existence. Mm -hmm. But I worry, Amit, that those who are most vehement in the BDS movement want nothing less than an end to the state of Israel. By the way, they don't, they don't need to kill Jews. But Israel should be gone. They, and there should be one state yeah. where everybody lives, Palestinian, and everybody gets a vote. And it won't be a Jewish state. Am I going too far, do you think? No. You can see that. 
Omar Barghouti, one of the founders of, uh, founders of, uh, of uh, the BDS movement, said that the first demand of the BDS movement is the right of return. What is the right of return? The right of return means end, the end of the state of Israel. Because if we will, get, we will have uh, 9 or 12, there is a debate if it's 9 or 12, yeah? 9 or 12 million refugees from Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, into uh, Israel, that will be the end of the state of Israel. You don't need a war. It's the end of the Jewish people in Israel. Everybody knows that. So if you are supporting BDS, you're supporting actually uh, the end of the state of Israel. Mm -hmm. So I don't think you're, uh, you're okay. going so far. I don't understand Hillel. I don't understand why any Jewish organization on campus would, would invite BDS individuals to speak or why would they would ask breaking the silence to speak. You've dealt with many people on campus. You've dealt with Hillel offices. What's your experience and what do you think the answer is? I'll, I'll start with the end. We uh, sent a letter to uh, Hillel, Eric, uh, uh, to Hillel. Um, the national head of Hillel. We sent them a letter signed by 16, we signed them, 69 uh, uh, parliament members from the Knesset from both political parties, even uh, Ha'avoda, Halikud, both political parties, and uh, Bibi Netanyahu also. And we sent them a letter uh, signed by also 700 officers and soldiers, all of them fighters, saying, stop bringing, breaking the silence to Hillel campuses. Stop giving them a stage. And at least, if you're giving them a stage, invite us to refute, to you know, just to, to, uh, to respond. Because I think, mo for me, personally, what is most hurting, uh, 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 more than the BDS movement lies, or breaking the silence lies, is that uh, American Jewish student, who are very confused, he don't know Israel very good, who is sitting there and listening to that lecture, and he's got a, you know, a even a tiny dub about, about me about my ethics at work, about me as an Israeli, about my, my soldier, about my country, about his country also. That hurting me the most. And when a Jewish student sitting in a lecture in Hillel and hearing Avner Gvaryau or others from Breaking the Silence, that's hurting me the most. We send a letter, we never get an answer. So I don't have an answer for you. I don't know why. Mm -hmm. I don't know why. Mm -hmm. And it's the same with J Street. How do you feel about J Street? I think they go too far. They go too far, to extreme left, too far. And they also bring in Breaking the Silence and uh, Jewish Voice for Peace and others. And I think it's, it's for me, it's a shame. Mm -hmm. For me, it's a shame. And I want to at least be there also. Not me personally. My, you know, my friends, other Israeli organizations, but we don't have the stage. Mm. They won't give we you the don't, We don't, no. They won't invite you. They won't. They won't. Mm -hmm. I want to come back to the question of how Israeli soldiers, not in an orchestrated way, but in an individual way, and I'm going to make it broader. It's not about the Israeli soldier. When you see the way in which... Israeli society mm -hmm. deals with the Israeli Palestinian or the Palestinian who lives on the West Bank. Are there areas you feel Israel has to improve? Um, I, it's a complicated situation we live. That's for sure. Checkpoint. To, to go through a checkpoint, it's not an easy thing. It's not a comfortable thing to do. As a Palestinian who lives in, in Judea and Samaria, it's not a comfortable thing. But you have checkpoints also in JFK here, not far away. If you not the same. It's not the same. I said checkpoints, it's something necessary if you are in a reality of terror. Believe me, I don't want to be there as a soldier. I don't want to be there. And the IDF don't want to be there. When, but when you have a 13-year-old girl, slaughtered while she is sleeping in her bed, you have to put some checkpoints in the, in the internus of Kiryat Arba just to make sure there is no terrorist get inside. 
the Palestinians, they don't need checkpoints to check Israelis because uh, uh, um, the Israelis or, or, or the settlers are not coming into houses, breaking into houses and slaughtered uh, uh, Palestinians. That's the reality. But for sure, it's not, it's not comfortable for the civilians, for the uh, Palest civilian uh, uh, Palestinian civ civilians, it's not easy. Is it comfortable for the Palestinian to have Israeli soldiers basically always lurking? The reality is that Israel does have the IDF on the West Bank, everywhere on the West Bank. Everywhere. And again, it's more or less, but they're always there. And that is what some people say it means for the Palestinians people living under occupation. The truth is, Palestinians do have a total society of their own. Their own government, their own schools, their own radio, their own television. Every, but there's one thing. The Israeli army is there. How do you feel about that for them? The, first, the, the Israeli army is not there. You have Nablus, you have Hebron, you have Ramallah, you have Jenin. These, the IDF is not there. The Palestinian there. The IDF is not anymore in the big cities. The IDF is just on the main roads and uh, uh, between the, uh, um, the, the settlements where Jewish people live to keep uh, uh, Jewish lives, but they don't uh, uh, go in into Jenin or Ramallah or Hebron. If you live in the middle of Nablus, you don't have checkpoints on your way from school and back. If you live on one of the villages, small villages around Hebron or around uh, uh, Kirat Arba or around uh, Efrat or Bet El, you will have to go through a checkpoint. But, and again, I think it's a hard situ situation for the Palestinians. But it's necessary. But it's necessary. What, what is the other option? The other option is to do what? Mm -hmm. If we will get the IDF back from Judea and Samaria, leave there the, the Jewish uh, settlers, uh, without an agreement with the Palestinians. So just take the IDF out. What will happen? We all know what will happen. Even when we got out from Gaza with the settlers, <laughs> not leaving them behind, with the settlers, what we've got? We've got tunnels. Mm -hmm. We've got missiles. Mm -hmm. We've got more and more uh, TNT mm -hmm. in, in, in uh, Gaza. So I think there is no other options now. And what about the way in which the Palestinian Israeli is treated inside Israel. Is the Palestinian Israeli citizen treated exactly the way a Jewish Israeli citizen is treated? Yeah, in my opinion, yeah. You can see them in the Knesset. They've got representative. You can see them on the high court. Oh, you know, they, you say, they're, they say they're not. They say they are second-class citizens. They say the government does not allot the same amount of money and funding for Arab communities than it would for Jewish communities. I don't think I don't I don't see that that way. Just I think uh, a year ago, or less, uh, the government, this government, the right wing government, gave them uh, uh, a budget of nine uh, billion do uh, shekels to uh, for the first time for the Arab community uh, in Israel. But you know, to live in a in a in a in a state as a minority is always it's it's a problem. It's always a problem in every country, but I think Israel is doing the best. Mm -hmm. You have uh, Palestinian, uh, you have uh, our Israeli Arabs in the Knesset, you have Israeli Arabs in the academia. Myself, I've, I've been to the Technion, I'm a civil, a civil engineer. I, I had numerous uh, uh, Arab uh, 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 teachers. There is, by the way, an Israeli Arab sitting on the Israeli Supreme Court. Yeah, yeah. Um, by the way, where were you in Operation Protective Edge? I was uh, on. I was al already a civilian. So you didn't have you, no. Okay. No. Um, how did you feel about the way that operation was reported in the media? And you've already mentioned Hasbara. You could. You should say it again. How you define Hasbara, and what do you feel the alternative, the better alternative, to what is known as Hasbara? We normally call it public mm -hmm. relations in English. Mm -hmm. But how do you define Hasbara? All right. So, again, about protective edge, I think uh, uh, it, was, it was a Hasbara all the time. Yeah, we're right, but. Israel is right, but. It's the but that bothers you. It's the you. but, yeah. Like, like I will say, I love my wife, but. 
Let's say you say to your, your wife, I love you, but. <laughs> Uh, but I think... Uh, Where's the but come from? Why is that so? Why is there so much but I think involved in the Jewish defense of Israel? You always want to be part of the... Uh, part of everyone, part of the international community, and you want to be accepted by everyone. And it's hard to be accepted by everyone. It never goes. It's very hard. And the minute you're starting to do that too much, you're losing your way. You're losing the justice of your way when you don't know in the middle of a war to say, enough, there is bad guys. We tried a lot. We got out of Gaza. They are sending missiles all over Israel. There's no but necessary. There, there is, here, there is no but necessary. We can do, we should do everything we can and we are doing to uh, uh, avoid civilian casualties. But uh, 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 we have to win. We have to win this. It's a matter of life and death. That's what it is. And we lost 70 soldiers in that uh, operation. But it was, you know, two or three weeks of missiles all over Israel, tunnels going down to Kibbutzim near to the, you know, uh, the south of Israel, next to the border. We, we have to, uh, uh, you know, to, uh, to be there in a protective edge. Um, so about the Hasbara. So I think most of the organizations are on, and even the state of How Israel. How do you define Hasbara again? Hasbara is apologizing before the debate begins. Like, you start a debate, but then it's, it, before the debate begins, you say, I'm sorry, I'm wrong. You cannot win in a debate like this. And I think the way we should uh, uh, take is, uh, is not talking about who we are or oh, talking about the good guys. We're always talking about Israel, what we managed to achieve in 60 years, agriculture and high tech. And we are, you, you know, we are good in, in that field and the other field. And we are uh, very moral, better than an, uh, any army. We are the most moral uh, people all over the world. I don't think so. I think we are regular people who want to live regular life peacefully. And I think the way is to talk about the bad guys. Because if you're a student in Columbia University or NYU and you're supporting BDS, no problem. But you have to know what you're supporting. If you're married to that woman, you have to know who is the woman. And if you are LGBT, and if you are a black person, and if you are a, I don't know, minority here in the States who's supporting BDS, all right. I just want to tell you that Hamas and Hezbollah and others are throwing LGBT from rooftops. And if you are a feminist, I just wanted you to know that BDS movement support groups that women cannot drive or can, don't have the right to vote. And if you are a, 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 a minority, I just want oh, 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 the blacks here in the, in, in the States, I just wanted you to know what, what, uh, how they treat their minorities. And if you are a, a, a Christian, I just wanted you to know how they treat Christians. I don't want to talk about Israel. I just want to talk about who are you supporting. Very interesting. Defending freedom from hate. If you want to, you know, they use, they are very smart, the BDS. They use the right words, freedom and hate and apartheid. And those words, then you can be very, uh, uh, you know, it's seductive. sensitive. To, yeah. It is it's seductive. It's for, seductive for the, for the uh, uh, average liberal student. Absolutely. But you have to know the whole picture. You have, to know, you have to get to know your woman before you get married. So I think that's the way, that's the way we want to operate. Okay. I want to ask you a question. I'm not looking for a discussion. I want mm -hmm. your answer. Yeah. If there were a Palestinian people, and now I mean government, administration, leadership, mm -hmm. which said to the State of Israel, we want to live with you the way Canada lives with the United States. No fighting, no enmity. We may not love you, but we're ha there will be no violent, violence directed at Israeli. We recognize your right to exist as a Jewish state, and we're going to live on the other side of the border. I mean, would you be willing to live side by side with that kind of state? No question. Do you think your friends would? Yeah, no question. Do you think most Israelis would? No question. By the way, I think it's... I wish Americans 
and American Jews understood. No the question is no question for you. No question. No question. Enough. We don't want to. I don't want to send my children to the army. I want them to be on NYU when they are 18 and not in 21. Okay. I have one. I minute. think just just you for that ahead. because yesterday Khaled Marshall, he said an interesting thing. Just yesterday he said. Uh, not recognizing Israel, it's not an obstacle to peace. That's what he said. He said, not recognizing Israel as the Jewish state, it's not an obstacle to peace. If you were done recognized me as Jewish people in Israel, I cannot talk with you. I don't want to talk with you. Okay, we only have a minute or so left. Yeah. So it's got to be a summary here. Yeah. What are the goals of your organization? Reservists on duty, what are the things you hope to do? What are you trying to do? Give me the brief answer. We want to be part of the struggle against the BDS movement. We want to be a unique voice, unique voice among others uh, again, uh, in that struggle against BDS movement, that first. And the second is to expose, keep and expose uh, Israeli organizations who are supporting uh, those movements here in the States BDS movements and fueling them with materials about us, about the idea of soldiers. You are fabulous. Thank you. Kola Gavod, your Tzemin Akal, absolutely out of this world. I hope this is only the first time you sit in that chair. Whenever you're around in the United States, you come and we'll talk. And right. I, I want to learn from you. I want our audience to learn from you. But I can't thank you enough. Thank Kol you. Very much. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Major Amit Derry, retired, founder and chairman of Reservists on Duty. It is one of the most important Israeli organizations now operating on the world scene. If you ever see them around, I hope you support them. If they're ever you know, speaking in your community, be sure you go and see them. And maybe you'll be lucky enough to see Amit himself. As always, I invite you to be in touch with me with any thoughts or comments you may have. Please email me, write me, post on our Facebook page, or tweet me. I look forward to hearing from you. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. L'chaim, my friends, to life. of Jewish education in media. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS, the Jewish Broadcasting Service, with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double high or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the JBS homepage and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM, to GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.